So this morning we are going to be looking, if we can start, I've been told I have the control this morning, but if we can start, we're going to be looking at our priest Jesus, the Son of of God. In these uh, next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the person of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And we're going to look at the, the various uh, functions, the various names and titles that he holds that give us such an incredible salvation and an incredible relationship with God through him. But Jesus is our priest. And um, before we look at uh, him as a priest, as in all things when we study, it is always good to look at the meaning of words. Uh, I've said it before, I will say it again, other than your Bible, you should be looking at your concordance often that you will understand what words actually mean because the original text in the New Testament written in Greek is a far more complex language than our own and far more precise. And so the way that it's been translated either into English, French or any other language, sometimes we fail to see really what God is saying. So let us quickly look at first in Hebrews. This is our first verse that gives us uh, 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 the intimation that Jesus has passed into the heavens, this great high priest, Jesus has passed into the heavens. He is none other. We know the Son of God. So priest in Hebrew is kun. And it's basically very general. It just means one who officiates. And in Greek, it's hereus, which basically means sacred. And as you can see, the, the, the word priest uh, doesn't really explain itself by the word that's used. But what we see in the scriptures is that the word priest is then explained uh, by the roles that are then given them. You understand? So the word priest itself doesn't give us much understanding as to the role, but we will see that actually the... Uh, where do I have to point this? That way? It's not working. Can you hit the button for me, please? Thank you. One who mediates between God and peoples by sacrifices, offerings, by praying, and by blessing them. That, in general, is what a priest does. Sacrifices for sin, offers for thanksgiving, prays to intercede, and blesses to bring God's blessing onto people's lives. Amen. We also see that the first, oh, that's it. We see that the first act as a priest for Jesus was actually in the Garden of Eden. Does anybody understand what I'm saying here? And for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. You remember that the only begotten Son of God walked in the garden, had fellowship with Adam and with Eve. And there was one day when he came for fellowship and he said, Adam, where are you? are you. We know the story, Adam and Eve both were hiding because they were naked because they had eaten of the tree that they shouldn't have eaten of and they understood their nakedness. And we are told that to cover that nakedness Jesus made them coats of skin. And you will say, well, why, why did he have to kill? Um, maybe he just, uh, you know, went shopping and bought them some fur. 
the point is this, we know he had to kill something because we know that in Genesis that God saw that everything he had made was very good. And death is not part of God's very good. Animals before the fall did not die. Nothing in his creation died because God called it very good. Neither did animals eat one another. They ate grass. It was a very, very different world. And so we know that he had to take an animal and take its life to cover their shame, which is a pattern for things to come. But that was the first uh, time that Jesus acted as a priest for man and woman. Wonderful. Any guesses as to what animal he might have chosen to make skins for them? Huh? A lamb? It doesn't say, but probably. Who knows? I, 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 I expect so. So, we see the priesthood actually, because when we think of the priesthood, we're often thinking of Aaron and his priestly clothes in the Old Testament, don't we? Which is part of the Mosaic law. But we see Jesus again as priest before the law of Moses. And we read in Hebrews uh, that I have begotten you. Once again, that word begotten. So Jesus wasn't just begotten as the Son of God, but in being begotten as the Son of God, we are told, I have begotten you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's, there's, there is a little bit of... Um, what can we say? Uh, there's not much said about Melchizedek. We first meet him, actually, um, in... Again, I don't know if this is working or if someone else is helping. Hello? Thank you. We meet Melchizedek in Genesis 14. After that, in fact, uh, Abraham went against his enemies and went to get Lot, his family and others and defeated the people that had taken Lot. And um, after his victory, we are told he is met by Melchizedek who brings forth bread and wine and we're told, and he was the priest of the Most High God. What's very interesting as well, though, is that Melchizedek is first known as the King of Righteousness and the King of Peace. Now, it's my opinion that he wasn't the king of an earthly realm, but this talks about the kingdom in heaven, which is a kingdom of righteousness and of peace. You can see that in Hebrews 7 and verse 2. Melchizedek is also spoken of in the millennium. If you look at Psalm 110 and verse 4, we, we see the rule of the Son of God in the order of Melchizedek in the millennium period. Not that there will be any more sacrifice being made for forgiveness of sin, but Jesus will nonetheless continue to act as a priest. And so he takes out bread and wine. Again, you see how in the scriptures there's always a pattern where God uses uh, sacrifice, then he brings out bread and wine, this, again, always foreshadowing the things that were to come. It's not by uh, 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 mistake or it's not by chance that Melchizedek brought bread and wine. It was very purposefully done. And so where does he come from, this king uh, uh, and priest Melchizedek? Here we have it. Without father or without mother. Without descent, neither having the beginning of days or end of life. Who else can that be? 
can only be the Son of God, who has no beginning, without father or mother. Notice it's a, a small f and not a capital F. Amen. So we, we have to just believe uh, through Scripture that Melchizedek was our Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who manifested himself as a priest to Abraham. Amen. Beautiful, isn't it? Let's go on. Now, we look now at Jesus when he was come into the world in his incarnation. Um, we are told he came basically uh, to take three roles. It is prophet, priest, and king. Okay? And he first came to Israel. Uh, but he came to Israel as prophet, priest, and king. As a priest, we see then it makes it very clear who in the days of his flesh, speaking of Jesus. Do you notice that? Jesus, the Son of God, had days before his flesh. Otherwise, it wouldn't be said in the days of his flesh. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, you would, you would think to yourself, but how does... Jesus, the Son of God, learn obedience. Well, the point is this, is that Jesus, when he came out of the Father, was perfect, of course, for he was God manifest in angelic form, in spirit form. The point is, though, is that when he became flesh, when he came to dwell on earth as a man in the flesh, he then had to learn obedience in the flesh as a man in the flesh. And obedience is nothing that you can know through your omniscience or your omnipotence or your omnipresence. It's something that you have to live and go through. And this is why I often say when I'm speaking uh, on the streets of Geneva that uh, God knows what it is to be a man. We can never say to God, well, you don't know what it's like to live down here. Yes, I do, he says. <laughs> I do know. Jesus does know what it is to live in the flesh, in human flesh. And we're also told in another part that he was made perfect through the things he suffered. Notice that suffering is a part of being made perfect perfect. Why? Because we are made perfect because we either, Jesus, what did he do? He resisted all temptation. And he accepted every uh, 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 um, request that the Father made on him. And so by doing that, he suffered. He suffered. And he was made perfect by the choices that he made as a man. And for that, he then becomes the perfect priest. And we see it now, next verse. And having me being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Praise God. Why? Jesus said, look, about being made perfect, he said, for in the prayer in John 17, he says, for their sakes, that's you and me, I sanctify myself. What is sanctification? Sanctification is going through uh, uh, all of temptations uh, and overcoming them. Sanctified is obeying every commandment of the Father. He did those things throughout his life, but we are told he didn't just do it for himself. He did it for us. So that why? He could become the perfect high priest, as well as the sacrifice, we'll look at that another time, to become the author of eternal salvation. Isn't that fantastic? And it's important, you see, because the high priest normally in the Old Testament, if you know your Old Testaments, he was able to go into the Holy of Holies once a year, and first, before doing that, he had to shed blood for his own sins. Yeah? Once he had sh shed blood for his own sins, then he shed blood for the sins of the people. 
Jesus, as a high priest, did not need to shed any blood for his own sins. As a high priest, he was able to enter into the Holy of Holies. He was able to present himself to God on our behalf without having the need to shed blood for his own life. Why? Because he was made perfect through the things that he suffered, because he was obedient in everything. Oh, that's so wonderful, so beautiful. And so, as we see, for there is, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Notice that. It's the man Christ Jesus that mediates on our behalf. It is the man Christ Jesus that is the high priest. And he it is that mediates between God and you. And you don't need anybody else. Uh, we have uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people who still today feel that they cannot go to God and they cannot go to Jesus uh, themselves directly and they have to go through a priest. You do not need a priest. Jesus is the high priest. You can go directly to him. He who made the ear hears your voice. He who made your eyes sees your life. You don't need to go through anybody. You can direct yourself directly to Jesus, the high priest. He is the mediator between you and God. Wonderful. Thank you, Lord. And anytime, anywhere, any place. Hallelujah. As we were praying this morning, we don't have to buy a ticket. We don't have to make a rendezvous. Anytime in your day, you can just turn to him and pray. Thank you, Lord. He has done that for us. Now, Jesus, through his... Uh, uh, his ministry. Look, I'm just putting this away. Would you please uh, go to the next slide? Thanks so much. On for next week, if it's going to work, make it work, please. Thank you. Uh, just the first, please. Thank you. Now, Jesus, when he was on the cross, after his ministry, he says these words, does he not, on the cross? Do you remember? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, a lot of people just feel that those words are spoken to the people who put him on the cross. But actually, I think that that prayer is the culmination of his whole life and that we, our sins, put Jesus on the cross. And the truth of the matter is, is that I believe that from Adam and Eve to us, most of us, we do not discern the gravity and the power of sin and of evil. We don't realize how evil evil is, how sinful sin is. And that is a prayer, I believe, that Jesus made not just for the people who put him on the cross, but for all of us, because truth be told, we don't understand most of the time the things that we do, the gravity of the things that we do when we sin. And Jesus made that intercessory prayer saying, Father, forgive David. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have a clue. Forgive him. Thank you, Lord. And I still don't have a clue sometimes. Yes, on that cross, that was the key prayer of mediation, I believe, because it really does address all the consequences of eating that forbidden fruit. You see, Adam and Eve came to know good and evil, but it's not enough to know good and evil to be able to control evil in your life. You understand? You can, you can be very clever and, and be a clever devil. You know, the world talks about all we need is education. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, if all we need is education, 
um, then the world would be a far, far better place than it is now because most people are educated uh, in respect to what, what we had 100 years ago. Education is not what we need. It's a new heart is what we need. And the beautiful, the next verse is right at the end. Jesus says to his father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Uh, you know, Jesus went back to the Father at that point in time. It's important to understand that Jesus, when he was on that cross, his body stayed, but he gave up his spirit. Notice it's his spirit. It's the spirit of the man. Not the Holy Spirit, but his own spirit that he commended up to God and his spirit went to be with God that's what we're told in Ecclesiastes 2 7 the spirit returns to God his its maker but his body stayed on that cross and we know the story the body may have stayed but three days later that body rose from the dead and the spirit of Jesus that had, been, had gone to the Father came back into him with the power of God and he raised himself from the dead. People say, well, who raised Jesus from the dead? Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life and I have the power to raise it up again. Jesus did it through the power of his Father, of course, as we saw last week. It's all of God, it's all of from the Father, but it's by Jesus. And so even Jesus himself was the one who decided, right, it's about time. Whoosh, here I go, back into this body, glorified, hallelujah. And we see that the first person that he meets is Mary Magdalene. How about that? First person that Jesus meets when he's resurrected is none other than an ex-prostitute. Tells you how God doesn't care who you are, where you're from, what you've done. Amen. And uh, when he meets her, she, he says to her, touch me not. For I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now, a lot of people have different opinions of saying, why did Jesus say, don't touch me? We won't go into that. But what is incredibly important is that Jesus would present himself now in flesh, into heaven, and uh, he died for our sins, yes, but he rose again to present himself in heaven, making a way for us also in the flesh to go to heaven and present ourselves before God. This is a beautiful thing, is that Jesus didn't just make sure that our sins were forgiven before God and all was right, but our whole life, everything, our flesh included, we're told one day we will be translated. What does that mean? For those of us who are alive, we all of a sudden will be translated. Our flesh will be translated as Jesus' flesh was when he was risen. And we will meet him in the air. And that is possible because Jesus himself went to God in the flesh and say, here I am and now therefore all those that believe in me, they too can come in the flesh in the presence of God the Father. In Romans 4.25 it says he was delivered for our, def our offences. He died for our sin, but he was raised for our justification. What does that mean? You see, he died for our sins to be forgiven, but then he rose that we might receive every blessing of God that Jesus has and he shares with us. Isn't that beautiful? This is what this high priest of ours has done for us. Our sins aren't just covered, they're forgiven. And our lives have been purchased and we then receive the great prize of eternal life 
and of the glory that is Jesus's, that he shares with us. Isn't that beautiful? As we go on. Now, I often used to read a, a verse in Luke 22, and it, and it, and it was the, the time where uh, Jesus was speaking to Peter. And, and Peter, uh, you remember Peter, he always thought he was doing such a good job and that he was the ace of uh, all the uh, apostles, etc., etc. But there was a time when Jesus spoke to him and he said, listen, Peter, uh, Satan has desired to kill you, to have your life, but I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And so when you're converted, help your brothers. And, um, and Peter, of course, uh, protested profusely, but as always, Jesus was right. And you know, I always used to say to Jesus, you know, Lord, it's not fair. I wish I'd had you as a prayer partner. <laughs> How would you like to have Jesus as your prayer partner? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yes. And so I was saying, oh, you know. But there's good news. Jesus is your prayer partner. His priesthood did not finish once he went into heaven. We're told in Hebrews 7.25, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is ever living, interceding for you and for me. So what he did for Peter, he does also for us. But hold on, how does that work? He's only got one mouth. How can Jesus intercede for us? We see in Hebrews, we'll come back to that question. He, we'll see in Hebrews as well, 4.15. We have not a high priest which can't be touched with the feelings of our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted, yet without sin. That's another thing with the ongoing priesthood of Jesus. We have a priest that's touched by our weaknesses. Do you understand that? When, when you come to Jesus with the same problem that you've had for 20 years, some of you it's 30, but let's say 20 years, and, and you think, oh, here I am again. Do you think Jesus goes, oh, not you again? What, the same thing? No, he is touched by the weaknesses that you have in your life. He knows you have them. And he knows it. If, you could, if you could press a button and take those weaknesses out of your life, he knows you would. If you, if you, if, for some of you, if you had to walk 50 kilometers and you knew if you walked 50 kilometers, you would never sin that sin again, I bet half of the room would stand up and start walking that 50 kilometer walk. God knows the weaknesses that we have, the challenges that we have, and he's touched. He's touched. And so we, we know we can always come to him and his arms wide open, ready to receive us. And that's why it says we can come boldly Boldly, not, you know, like this. Do you remember when you used to do something wrong with, with, and your parents, they found out, and you, you know, you, you, you wouldn't walk into the room like that, would you? You'd, like, walk really slowly and, uh, you know, your head down, trying to look as though you were, you know, really sorry. And you don't need to do that with Jesus. He says, it's all right, come. What have you got to tell me? He knows already. What, what's happened? Ah, that again. All right, I understand. No problem. Lord, I really don't want to do it again. I know. And he knows that you will do it again one day. It's okay. That's the beautiful priesthood of Jesus. Always arms open, ready to receive us. So let's come back to them. I wish I had Jesus as a prayer 
partner. Let's quickly look at this, because we have to make it clear. John 14, 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode. We will come and be in you, Father and Son. Jesus said, John 17, 21, Thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. And verse 23, I in them and thou in me. We know that when we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives, we receive both Father and Son. The Son brings the Father, and he comes to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit. And the wonderful thing about that, we we now read Romans 8, 26, And we are told, the Spirit makes intercession for us. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are told that God gives us a language, a prayer language. We're told it's to pray in tongues. And when we pray in tongues, that is where many a time Jesus will be praying through you for you. Isn't that beautiful? He that prays in an unknown tongue, not speaks, prays, edifies himself, we are told in the scripture. When you are praying in an unknown tongue, you are edifying yourself because God, through Jesus, is praying for you for the things that you don't even know you need sometimes. So when you don't know how to pray, and if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have the gift to pray in tongues, pray in tongues. You always know this. It's always on point. You will always pray according to God's will when you pray in the Holy Spirit and in the tongues that God gives you. That is the way he makes intercession for us. Christ in you prays for you when you pray in the Spirit. Beautiful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And so our conclusive remarks, wonderful, Hebrews 7 and 24. But this man, hallelujah, this man, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. What he has done, as always, what Jesus does, what God does, it's done and it doesn't change. And it's forever settled in heaven. No man can change it. No demon can change it. Uh, The whole universe could, could cry out for change. And Jesus says, it's done. It's unchangeable. He's made provision for humankind right from the beginning. He was that mediator. And uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, Again, I just say uh, this testimony, but I have prayed for you, uh, is our testimony now. We can say that Jesus is with us, praying for us, praying so that our lives may be better, more complete, that we might be filled with all the knowledge of Christ and the grace uh, of God in our lives. Uh, and you can come to Jesus, I'm going to say it again, anytime, any place, anywhere. You can come to the mercy seat of God, to the throne of grace, and make your petition known to the high priest of your calling, Jesus, the Son of God, according to the priesthood of Melchizedek. And uh, 1 John 3, 2 says, When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Jesus as our priest, we have prayed to him. How many times have you prayed to Jesus? So many, many, many times. As your priest, Jesus has heard every single word and he has answered every single prayer. Maybe not the way you want it, but he has. And when you stand before him one day, you will realize what an incredible work he's done in your life because he is the faithful high priest in your life. 
May God bless you. Amen. Let us praise and worship the Lord this morning. Thank you, team.